Our seventh and final video from chapter eight is the one where we finally get into this other title. Right? Using delocalized electrons to discuss aromaticity and introduce the reactions of benzene, which we'll spend a later chapter in organic two discussing further. But before we can get into that, we need to talk about that word aromaticity and what makes a compound aromatic. It's a really important concept pertaining to delocalized electrons. Okay. And let's focus on the fact that according to heat of hydrogenation, something like benzene is way more stable than a carboxylate, even though they both have two stable resonance contributors. Okay. And for benzene specifically, it's more stable than what we would expect. And something with two resonance contributors. Okay. In addition, it doesn't undergo any reactions of our alkenes from chapter six, except under incredibly harsh conditions. Okay. So let's focus on this delocalization energy relative to something like cyclohexatriene. Okay. Why is benzene so much more stable? Well, benzene is the first compound we're going to see that is aromatic. And there's some criteria for a compound to be aromatic. It has to be cyclic. I'd write these down too. It has to be cyclic. It has to be planar. Um, and that's because every atom in the ring must have a p orbital that can overlap in series. Okay? That's why it has to be planar. Okay, so cyclic, planar, and have an odd number of pairs of electrons, which we'll talk about next. But do you see how those p orbitals overlap with one another to give us an uninterrupted cloud of pi electrons throughout? Like this couldn't be aromatic if there was something that was sp3 hybridized interrupting it. All right, so cyclic and planar to get that uninterrupted cloud of pi electrons. And in addition to that, it has to have an odd number of pairs of pi electrons which is a weird way for your textbook to describe it. Um, an odd number of pairs of electrons, so like one, three, five, seven pairs of electrons. I don't like remembering it that way. Uh, what I recommend to you, instead of remembering it in pairs of electrons, is to use 4n plus 2 pi electrons. Right? n can be any whole number, so 1, 2, 3, and so 4 times 1 plus 2 is 6, or 4 times 2 plus two is 10, like six and 10 are Huckle number of electrons. Okay, so that allows something to be aromatic. Benzene having six pi electrons, right, meets that four N plus two criteria. Okay. So here's two examples of things that aren't aromatic. Okay. Cyclobutadiene, it only has four pi electrons or two pairs, so it's not aromatic. Cyclooctatetraene, is also, it's not planar, and it has eight pi electrons, which again, four pairs, even number, does not meet the Huckel number of electrons. Okay. Here's some other compounds for you to look at. Right. What's wrong with these? Okay. Are they aromatic? Well, here, and this is a little bit of a problem with the slide, so I'm actually just gonna jump forward one. I don't like that typo, it looks like a minus which would change the answer. Right? Cyclopentadiene here is not aromatic because like I just alluded to, you can't have any sp3 hybridized in the ring. So change it to sp2, cyclopentadienyl cation, still not aromatic because it only has four pi electrons. It doesn't have the four n plus two. Two pairs of electrons doesn't work. Right? But if you have a cyclopentadienyl anion, right, that's aromatic because it has six pi electrons. And the first question that should come to your mind, how do I know that these are pi electrons right, or can serve as pi electrons? Well, ask yourself the question, can I draw a resonance contributor where those can be used to form a pi bond? If you can, then you can include these in your electron count for something to be aromatic, right? which is exactly what this is showing right here the different resonance contributors of cyclopentadienyl anion, seeing how those pi electrons get focused in, brought in, our overall resonance hybrid. Yep. So that gives me 
six total pi electrons, three pairs, and therefore it's aromatic. Okay. Another example, right? Chrysine here, is it aromatic? Well, I think to myself, is it cyclic? Bunch of rings, yes. Is it planar? Yes. How about my electrons? Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Okay, so 4n plus 2 equals 18. Does n work out to be an integer? Yeah, 4 in this case. So this is an example of something that's aromatic. And here's two others to look at for practice with these aromatic compounds. So let's think a little bit about molecular orbitals. It's actually super easy to draw a molecular orbital diagram for something that's aromatic. And all the trick, all you do, pick a vertex, point it at the lowest point facing down, and then draw lines corresponding to each vertex. Notice this line hits two, as does as this one. Uh, then the midpoint of your molecule, anything below it is bonding, anything above it is antibonding. And then you fill the electrons according to the alpha principle to the lowest energy up. And that's why we have a Huckel number of electrons. Right? Six pi electrons in benzene completely fill the bonding molecular orbitals, nothing in the antibonding molecular orbitals. And that's where the delocalization energy comes from. The fact that these bonding MOs are lower in energy than they would be otherwise. Okay. One other thing to have on your radar are anti-aromatic compounds. Right, which are actually incredibly reactive. Something that's anti-aromatic hits all the criteria for aromaticity. They're cyclic and they're planar, but they have an even number of pi electrons. Right? So these things are incredibly strong electrophiles because they want to gain an extra pair of electrons so that they have a Huckel number of electrons and they can be aromatic. You see they're the least stable of all compounds. Right? even less stable with, than things with just localized electrons. Those things are very reactive. So your first point of emphasis from this video is make sure you can classify something. Is it aromatic? Is it non-aromatic? It's just nothing. Or is it anti-aromatic? Okay, so aromatic, cyclic, planar, Huckel number of electrons. Anti-aromatic, cyclic, planar, non-Huckel number of electrons. But we've only looked at hydrocarbons so far, right? Things with carbon and hydrogen. Those aren't the only things that are aromatic. Okay. If you have something other than carbon in the ring, it's called a heterocycle or a heterocyclic compound. And so that's something where you have substituted for carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, or sulfur are the most common ones. Okay. These guys are aromatic as well. Let's take a look at pyridine, for example. Why is that aromatic? Well, it's cyclic and it's planar, but what about that extra pair of electrons? Well, those electrons are perpendicular to the p orbital, so they're not involved in the ring. And that's okay. Pyridine can still be aromatic because everything's sp2 hybridized throughout. So my p orbitals can still overlap. I have six total pi electrons, so I'm in business. Looking at pyrrole and furan, in that situation, five-membered ring, I incorporate my lone pair of electrons on nitrogen into the ring in the p orbital. So that gives me six total electrons. Same thing in furan. One of the pairs of electrons in oxygen is incorporated, the other one's left out. These things will move electrons around in order to have a Huckel number of electrons if it's possible. So look at the structures, jumping back some slides here. Here they're not incorporated, here they are. One pair in these two compounds is, the other pair is not. Think about your orbitals, form a Huckel number of electrons if you can by drawing the resonance contributors shown here on slide 140. Others for practice here on slide 141, here are some aromatic heterocyclic compounds. Take a look at them in each case figure out where your pi electrons are being incorporated in order to get an odd number of pair of pi electrons. I have my Huckel number of electrons, 4n plus 2. Because everything else is cyclic and planar, 
It all comes down to counting the electrons. So with that in mind, we finished chapter eight with a brief discussion of how benzene reacts because we've already said it won't do any of the reactions from chapter six under normal conditions. So what can benzene do? It does not do addition reactions because an addition reaction would destroy one of the pi bonds and interrupt the criteria for aromaticity. So what benzene does is substitution reactions. It takes an electrophile and substitutes one of the hydrogens, brings the hydrogen in, replaces, or sorry, brings the electrophile in, replaces the hydrogen, which gets kicked out. It gets substituted. Specifically, benzene undergoes an electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction, right? It reacts with an electrophile as an aromatic compound to do a substitution reaction. Yeah. And it will only ever do substitution reactions, not additions, because it wants to restore the aromaticity. Yeah. It has the pi electrons. If you go back and look at the structure of benzene, it has the pi electron cloud above and below the plane carbon atoms. So it can easily act as a nucleophile, just like in the first step. And we form a carbocation intermediate, just like we did back in chapter six. Okay. But then after that, I don't add a nucleophile okay, and end in an addition reaction. Okay. Because while that carbocation intermediate is more stable than other carbocations because of the duoglyzed electrons, we want to get that aromaticity back because there's inherent stability there. So I don't do an addition reaction, right? Rather, a nucleophile comes in, plucks off hydrogen from where the electrophile went, and those electrons go back to restoring the aromaticity, and I get a substituted aromatic compound. So that's a key idea right here. I do not do an addition reaction to an aromatic compound. It's always a substitution reaction to restore the aromaticity, because look at how much lower in energy that substituted product is. So if you wanna do something like add bromine, if you just have an alkene, that's all you need is elemental BR2 and you can do an addition reaction, right? This little anti-addition from chapter six. But if we wanna do that to benzene, We've got to get over the stability of benzene to get that thing to react in the first place. So you need to have a Lewis acid catalyst plus bromine together in order to substitute it. You have to have both of these in order for benzene to react. And keep that in mind for the reactions of benzene. Then you have your electrophile, you form your carbocation intermediate. And when you're drawing these reactions out, make sure you show all the resonance contributors for this middle step, okay? Because that carbocation can move around the ring. There's three resonance contributors there. Uh, and then your nucleophile comes in, plucks off hydrogen, restores your aromaticity, and you get your substituted product. So that's just an introduction to these reactions. And my big takeaway here, know that if you wanna add bromine, you have to have both of those in order to react. We'll talk about more of that in organic two, at reactions of aromatic compounds, but we just have that introduction in order to close off group one here. Okay. From chapters six, seven, and eight now, we've covered alkenes, alkynes, and dienes, and seen how they act as nucleophiles due to their electron-rich double bonds or triple bonds, right? That pi density, even here in aromatic compounds, allows it to act as a nucleophile. Okay. So with that, at the end of chapter eight, we've finished group one three more to go the rest of the semester in organic two. A quick summary slide for what's a very big chapter. Right? This does not cover everything. It's just a brief summary. Right? Alkenes have a single pi bond. Right? So they undergo one electrophilic addition reaction. That's chapter six. Chapter seven is where we got alkynes, which have two pi bonds. So they can undergo two electrophilic additions if you have excess reagents unless you do a tautomerization, a ketoenol tautomerization. We saw at the beginning of chapter eight, right? Isolated dienes, look at the stability of the carbocations. Conjugated dienes, much more of a challenge. We could do a one, two addition or a one, four addition. We have to identify the kinetic product and the thermodynamic product. And then in this last video, we don't do any additions for things that are aromatic. They only undergo substitution reactions. 
So that's a brief summary slide from group one. Obviously a lot more detail within there from chapter six, seven, and eight. So the criteria here from this video, what to know, right? Identifying if something is aromatic, not, or anti-aromatic, and the reactions of benzene. Big takeaways here, okay, which we'll continue to elaborate on later. And that concludes a very long chapter in chapter eight. Make sure you break this up into small manageable chunks and get all the big ideas out.